All right, welcome to the Online Academy of Biblical Online Academy of Biblical Studies. I don't. That's tomorrow. Listen, if you're joining us today, that is tomorrow. Uh, I want to welcome you to Reflections upon the Precious Book Divine, and uh, so good to have you. I see that uh, uh, we will uh, be uh, joined here in just a minute with uh, several Bible students that we will. Uh, have along the way. Uh, Brother uh, Bonner is joining us at this particular time uh, for Open Mic Friday, and uh, uh, I have not heard from our uh, compadre yet, but I know that uh, making tents can sometimes make you a little busy, and so uh, uh, we want to continue to uh, uh, pray for uh, all of our uh, uh, fellow Bible students uh, and uh, I see that several of them, Mike, are joining us now. So we want to uh, certainly uh, welcome everyone to the program. I do, I do want to r- remind you that this is study hall for the brave, for the spiritual-minded Bible student. And what, what is meant by that is that we make absolutely no apologies uh, for the truth that is spoken here or if the Bible demands a certain demeanor in doing that, we don't uh, apologize for that either, because that's a part of the truth. And uh, so uh, we do want uh, everyone to know, though, that if they come here uh, and uh, they join us in Bible study, that it is the Bible that we will study. If we What makes this such, I think, a wonderful uh, 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 study hall for me is the fact, Mike, that we are reflecting upon the precious book divine. Uh, it's, it's, it's not about, I, I love having Mike here, but it's not about having Mike here. It's about the fact that Mike's going to reflect upon the precious book divine uh, with us. He's going to guide and direct us. So I see that uh, uh, Brother Furness uh, has uh, joined us uh, from Purcell, uh, Oklahoma, and uh, uh, let's see, uh, Sister Higgins uh, from uh, South Texas. Uh, uh, Christine Woodall is all the way up in the northern woods of Wisconsin, and uh, so good to have her here. And I see that Miss Mona, uh, well, Miss Mona might have to contact, uh, oh, I tell you what, don't contact anybody. I'll tell you why we got music running on uh, uh, TGRN on the radio side, and that's because you have to click the alt cast button so that will uh uh that will come up here in just a minute and we will move from the singing to the actual program and so uh uh but mike it's it's good to have you today uh uh i know that this is open mic friday i know that we have a hot topic selected uh, uh true religion but before we really get to that, as our Bible students begin to come in, I see uh, Sister Ferris has joined us uh, as well. I believe, Sister Ferris, you are from uh, Alabama, if I remember. But uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, good to have you uh, uh, with us on the program uh, today. Uh, but, Mike, you got anything coming up that uh, 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 you want to advertise with regards to people? You're going to be somewhere, gospel meeting, something going on? Uh, I don't have anything coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, in September, uh, don't ask me the date. I think it's the second week of September. We'll be at in, in Ackerley. So I'll be with the brethren there in Ackerley. But also, um, I believe it's September the uh, 20th through the 24th, uh, I need to check on those dates. So I'm sorry putting it out there like this, but we have the uh, the debate between uh, Israel Rodriguez and Mac Beaver. And so that's gonna be coming up in September as well. And so they're gonna be discussing uh, the Holy Spirit. And so we're looking forward to that. I'll have more details concerning that um, next week, Lord willing. And I believe that is on the baptism of the Holy Spirit this time, yes. right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I'm 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 glad that uh, able to get to uh, that particular study. Uh, I think uh, that is uh, uh, one that is going to be very valuable uh, for brethren as well. Uh, I see that uh, Brother Javon Jesse from Hyderabad, India, has joined us in our Bible study as well. Well, I hate that it's going to be that week. I'll have to try to um, 
uh, listen online maybe uh, later because I'll actually be in Kansas City. If all things continue the way that they are, I'll, I'll be in Kansas City for the uh, Midwest lectures there in uh, Independence during that same week. Uh, so um, uh, we certainly want to keep that in mind. I know that a lot of gospel meetings and a lot of lectureships, things such as that have been, uh, uh, they've closed shop uh, for this year and uh, certainly understand that with regards to uh, 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 many of the things and the scare of the uh, pandemic and uh, uh, things such as that. So uh, we do want to keep all of those uh, who are affected by uh, that and uh, are going through difficult times. We want to keep them in our prayers as well. All right, um, uh, Brother Mike, uh, uh, we're talking about this. I, I, I gathered a few uh, stats because uh, one of the things I posted uh, on Facebook when I posted this was uh, that if every religion is equally valid and authentic, then there's no such thing as true religion. And uh, James 1, 26 and 27 really identifies for us uh, the fact that there is such a thing as true religion. And uh, so there are two things I, I think when I think of when I think of true religion. Of course, naturally, you go to James 1, 26 and 27 because it identifies there is such a thing. But, the you know, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about these items is that for one to possess true religion, he must, it f must first be true. Uh, you know, John 17 and 17, thy word is truth. And so it's interesting to me, I ran across just a, a, a few quotes uh, that I, I wanted to uh, start out with. And uh, uh, one is from uh, 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 Bishop Sponge. Uh, and uh, the reason why I'm, I'm choosing this one is, uh, this was delivered on a Q&A at the Parliament of World Religions. And uh, so this is the manner in which they think. He says, true religion is not about possessing the truth. Now, that in and of itself just kind of blows my mind a little bit, but uh, no religion does that. That's an interesting statement in and of itself. It is rather an invitation into a journey that leads one toward the mystery of God. And I thought, wow, you know, <laughs> there, there is so much wrong with every one of those statements that it, it is uh, uh, almost uh, uh, a program in and of themselves when you think about the fact that uh, true religion has nothing to do with possessing the truth, and in fact, no religion does that. Uh, and uh, so those in and of them, and a journey toward the mystery of God, I mean, how, uh, uh, how modern day can you get with your thinking? Obviously not coming out of the Bible, but coming right out of modern day uh, uh, mentality in regards to that. And so I, I, I think that's probably good enough to, to start us out, at least from the vantage point of if you go, if there is such a thing as true religion, then you've got to have the truth in order to have that true religion. That's right, that's right. Well, there's four things that I believe I want us to consider when it comes to pure religion or religion in general. Because if we can consider four things, number one, the origin. Mm. Number two, the meaning. Number three, the morality. And number four, the destiny. Then we ought to be able to come up with the true religion. Man, I like that. So, and when you think of the origin of the religion of God, before we start throwing out names such as Church of Christ, Church of the Living God, uh, the Household of Faith, what do we think about as it relates to the scriptures 
the origin of the church. Jesus said on one occasion in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18, 19 rather, in that context when he was talking to uh, his uh, apostles, disciples, and he said, who do men say that I the son of man am? And then they said, Jeremiah or Elijah, or one of the prophets. And then he said, but who do you say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then it was at that time that Jesus said, and I say this very swiftly, that he said, uh, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And so Jesus prophesied himself with his own mouth, his church, his called out ones. Now, we can go back to the book of uh, Isaiah 2, Joel 2, uh, Zechariah 1. Um, we can look at those prophecies to talk about the origin of the church. However, when we think about the church of Christ, Jesus prophesied that he was going to build his church. And so we understand that the church has an origin. The church has a meaning. What's the meaning behind the church? Well, the meaning behind the church is, is that she was going to be a moral culture. Mm. And so this moral culture, according to Matthew chapter 5 through 7, in the midst of an immoral world, no other religion can claim what the church of Christ claims. Mm. They can't claim that Jesus Christ is the head of their church. Why? Because Jesus only has one church. Right. And so the very fact that the Apostle Paul talks about that one body, Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, and that church body is the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Colossians 1, 18, so forth and so on, we understand that this church, this called out people, have a moral system that they have to live by. And so if I can wrap it up with one verse, 1 Peter uh, 1, verse number 15, uh, verse 16, be ye holy, I'm holy. That's the morality of the church, is the holiness of God. And mm -hmm. so one thing that denominationalism cannot claim is holiness. Why? Because holiness only belongs to those who are of God, 1 Peter 2, 9. You can't be in denominationalism, Brother Pope Joy, and be holy. Why? Because Jesus Christ established and built only one church, Matthew 16, verses uh, 16 through uh, 13 through 18, 19. But the destiny, what is the destiny of the church? The destiny of the church is glory with God heaven. Revelation 2, verse number 10. Revelation 20, uh, verse number 11 through 15, all the way to Revelation 22, verse number 5. And so we understand, and I know that's a broad perspective, but we're just, these are introductory remarks, so I just want to kind of go there with that. And so the origin, the meaning, the, um, the morality, and the destiny, I think, is something that we can kind of work around. I, I think you hit the a nail on the head with regards to those items, uh, uh, and you think about the, uh, the origin. If the origin of the religion is not in the mind of God, see, it's not uh, uh, according to uh, the bishop here, uh, we are on a journey and we're inviting people to a journey uh, that leads one toward the mystery of God. Uh, they see God as a mystery, not as a revelator. And God has revealed his will. Uh, he has given us uh, the journey that we are on. And so the origin, uh, and since Acts chapter 2, Brother Mike, yes, since Acts chapter 2, uh, if one is not in the church of Christ, his destiny is in damnation. Uh, that is, uh, uh, that is um, Mark, uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. It is Acts 2 verse 38, and so forth, and then uh, Matthew chapter 16, as you quoted earlier. And so it is imperative that we understand uh, the origin and the meaning, uh, the meaning of God's people. Who are these people? Uh, how can I, uh, how can they be identified? Uh, how, how can, how can their way be understood, you see, and so the 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 uh, meaning of these people and the morality 
uh, that uh, that's something that I want to get into uh, all of this with regards to some of the things that we're talking about, brother uh, brother McGinnis uh, uh, is uh, from uh, uh, the uh, North Texas area says the church is the pillar and ground of the truth uh, in First Timothy chapter three verse number fifteen, and uh, that is certainly true, and it's one of those uh, uh, passages that we want to give notation to when we talk about. Uh, the uh, purpose, the origin, and the message of the New Testament church. But you know what? When you think about the uh, meaning uh, of who are these people, you know, and, and, and I want to go back just for a half a second to James chapter 1, because I do believe the book of James is, is identifying for us some indicators you know, it used to be, we don't call them this anymore, at least uh, I've not heard this term in a long time, but it, it used to be, Mike, when you you, you had a little uh, uh, um, rod on the side of your steering wheel, and if you clicked it uh, up, then it turned on your right indicator. If you clicked it down, it turned on your left indicator. <laughs> Uh, they were called indicators. It was indicating that you were making a left turn or a right turn. And we just call them blinkers today. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I, I like the word indicator better because it's indicating something. It's blinking for a reason. Sure. And uh, James is all about indicators. Sure. And James chapter one is really a synopsis of the indicators of what true religion is all about. So True religion first must be true itself. It must be invested in the mind, in the origin, in the will of God expressed by revelation and inspiration. That is the first and foremost item. But then you add to that, and uh, uh, beyond that, it must uh, it, it must have a activator uh, and. Uh, uh, people should be able. Listen, if I if I push that indicator uh, down and uh, my left blinker does not come on, then it means that there's something wrong with the wiring system, right? Uh, okay. I might I might have a little uh, fuse that's out. It might be the bulb is out. It might be somewhere in that wiring system. Uh, it is frayed and it is not working properly. So even though even though I've turned it on, it's not indicating anything. Right. So there are a lot of people, and, and this is the illustration I'm thinking of, there are a lot of people that profess Christianity, but they really don't live Christianity. And uh, living Christianity is as much a part of this aspect. So when you talk about the morality, uh, that's uh, that's a part of that. And morality should demonstrate that there is some kind of conversion that has taken place, right? That true Christianity begins with a conversion process. Uh, it must be a conversion. If you notice verse number 26, if any man among you seem to be religious, uh, but uh, he says, and bridleth not his tongue, uh, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. I've clicked that indicator on, and uh, sometimes it might even be some of those old ones. It seemed as if it was working on the inside, but it wasn't working on the outside, right? Uh, the, the indicator wasn't indicating anything. And so it was vain for me to turn that indicator on, and there's nothing blinking back here. And uh, that's what James is talking about. There, there is a sense in which if I am not converted uh, to Christ and to Christianity, then there is uh, no value to that kind of religion, Mike. That's right. And, and, well, go ahead. Another thing we want to keep in mind, Brother Pope Joy, is that there are some indicators that God has left us. Number one, Christ is head. Then, okay, and like we said, Colossians 1, verse number 18, he is the head of the body, the church, and so Christ is head. But also, uh, we understand that there is an organizational structure 
mm -hmm. to the Church of Christ. Now, we understand since Christ is head, you have the apostles and prophets and teachers, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you have this orga organizational structure in the church, uh, let me go there real quick for our viewers and listeners. In verse number 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Notice the reason why. Now, this is a very important point right here, especially for those who are seeking the truth, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, notice the time word in verse number 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should be, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every trickery or wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now, the reason why uh, this is very important, because when you're looking at the organizational structure of the church, of the education, um, we know that denominationalism already doesn't fit this. Why? Right. Because when you think of the next part of the uh, organizational structure of the church, you have, it's in this list here, which one wasn't, you have elders, deacons. Well, here we understand that you have elders, which were pastors in this particular uh, passage in verse number 11, but you also have deacons, according to Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 1, to the uh, bishops and deacons. And so the organizational structure also demonstrates or indicates, let's use the word that you use, Brother Pope Joyce, it indicates that this is the church of the living God. Now, let's go ahead and be very specific here, Brother Pope Joy. In some uh, religious organizations, you have popes, you have cardinals, you have uh, these different structures. You have in like your Baptist church, you have a, a, a reverend or you have a head pastor, then you have an assistant pastor, and, and then you have women preachers. And all of this is part of the structure of these organizations. However, that's not how the Church of the Bible is or, uh, organized and structured. All right. Now, listen, Mike, uh, you mentioned uh, quite a bit of stuff there. And and uh, Sister Woodall uh, has uh, put something that I think is very important uh, about what you said in the chat window. And uh, she makes this point. She says, uh, you have to have the whole system working to have a complete function of a Christian. I really like that. That's pretty powerful. And, and the reason why that's a powerful statement, Brother Pope Joy, is because of Acts 2, verse 42. In Acts 2 and verse number 42, um, notice what the Bible there says. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Right. Now, if an organization is not abiding by the apostles' doctrine and the apostles are part of the organizational structure of the church, that, that means that's not the Lord's church. I can keep on moving. That's true. Yep. And so she's right. She's 100% right. And it, it is important that, uh, you know, that conversion process be one of the first things that's understood is, uh, first of all, you want to know where and what you're being converted to. So you have to have that complete system in line. But to activate any of that, there has to be a conversion in regards to that. And so that conversion process uh, is uh, so important. And uh, in fact, when you consider mainline denominationalism versus the New Testament church, uh, uh, many of them get fairly close in regards to that conversion. Uh, they, they talk about the importance of believing the gospel, and they talk about the importance of confession, and they talk about the importance of even repentance. Uh, that there be a process of conversion. Uh, but when it comes to the activating of all of those in the sense of 
uh, changing the state. See, a process must eventually get to a particular state. There, there's a metamorphosis that takes place in regards to a tadpole, but there is a particular point at which a tadpole is no longer a tadpole, it is a frog. That's right. And there is a process that one goes through that at a particular point, and the point is made by God, not us, that particular point is baptism in water uh, by a penitent believer who has made confession of Christ. And it is at that point that God has a dividing line between uh, a lost state, tadpole, and a saved state, a Christian. And that's, that's 100% right, Brother Pope Joy. Uh, hence, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. I'm not going to read that, but want to refer to it. Why is Paul reminding uh, the church at Rome what they did in order to have their sins washed away in order mm -hmm. for them to identify with the death of Christ, in order for them to identify with the resurrection of Christ, keeping in mind that according to Acts chapter two, and I don't wanna speak as if I always remember stuff because I don't, but we have to keep in mind according to Acts chapter two and verse number 10, the Roman brethren actually obeyed the gospel in Acts chapter two, and so if, if we don't if we don't remember where they obeyed the gospel, they heard the first gospel sermon, and strangers of Rome, Jews, right. proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, and so in Acts chapter two they obeyed the gospel. In Romans chapter six, Paul is reminding them, "Whoa, y'all already obeyed the gospel. Remember how you did it." And then so when you look at Acts chapter 18, you got the church at Corinth, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 reminds them of the gospel message. Here's, here's the distinction as it relates to true religion. Those in denominationalism, when it comes to the gospel, and I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it. You ask those in denominationalism, what is the gospel? They'll say it's the Bible, it's the word of God, it's good news. It's, but they can't take you to 1 Corinthians 15 where it actually tells you what the gospel is. I venture to say that if a person can't tell you what the gospel is, they're not saved. Why? Ooh. Because Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, Jesus told his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believes what? The gospel and is baptized. Why? Because of the gospel shall be saved. Why? The gospel. And so denominationalism, they, they fail when it comes to that. And so this is where we come in with the truth and we say, do you know what the gospel is? Well, well, yeah. And then if they don't answer properly, then through uh, love and concern for their soul, Ephesians 4.15, we show them just like Philip did the, the eunuch. He says, uh, he says uh, do you understand what you're, uh, what you're reading? How can I accept someone guide me? Mm -hmm. By the way, Mike, I, I, that, that's that's exactly where we need to start. Now I want to jump on, uh, not jump on, but jump toward us in regards to this. So let's say that I've done all of that. I've made that conversion process in the sense of obeying the gospel initially, but James is now written not to the denominational world. It's written to us. And uh, in that, uh, it talks about our lifestyle. In particular, he talks about our tongue. And uh, if a man does not bridle his tongue, and it does, it interests me that James starts out with the tongue rather than the lifestyle. He gets to the lifestyle, but he's talking, now he's already dealt with lifestyle up in the context but I mean, in these two verses, he hones in on true religion. True religion is either magnified uh, or denied by the tongue oftentimes. For example, let me get you uh, maybe just a, a quick list, Mike, in, in regards to some of these things. Vulgarity, obscenity, indecent language 
is an indicator that I have not been converted uh, and I'm not living uh, that lifestyle. Dirty jokes, off-color stories, pornographic language, uh, uh, ethnic slurs, uh, humor that's meant to insult or tear people down, angry outbursts uh, uh, where we are uncontrolled in that, uh, 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 gossip, uh, spreading rumors, false accusations, uh, uh, imputing bad motives to people. Uh, love uh, does not do that, right? Uh, how about this one? I, I see this quite often, and it 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 really does um, um, irritate me when uh, uh, spouses are always criticizing uh, uh, one another in public. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm not saying that you should that you know you can't say anything negative. Uh, certainly, people know me better than that, but. There is a sense in which if you're if you're the person that's always criticizing Mike, your wife's cooking, uh, then you're not building her up. That is in front of other people and things such as that. If you're if you're criticizing the way that she keeps house or the way that she uh, talks or the way that she does things, then uh, uh, you're not you're not building her up. You don't have her highest good at heart. Uh, so that idea of endless criticism uh, is is not what Christianity is about. Uh, uh, I, you know, sometimes we involve ourselves in uh, uh, cheap shots, right? Uh, I mean, I think most people know what I verbal cheap shots. Uh, where we we you know sometimes we say that was below the belt. In other words, uh, it was uncalled for speech and accusations. Uh, I, I think about this one as well. Uh, there are some people that you're around, Mike, that's always got to be talking. No matter what they're saying, they're not really considering what they're saying, but they're always talking. And uh, when you talk too much, you end up saying too much. Uh, and a fool utters his whole mind. Uh, you mentioned this one earlier, talking without listening. That's right. But what kind of conversation is that? Uh, teacher or no teacher, you got to be listening. Uh, to the things that other people are saying, uh, and uh, exaggeration. Uh, sometimes people are uh, they they're given to exaggeration. They're always uh, um, uh, either exaggerating other people's faults, or they're exaggerating their. Uh, 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 you know, how about this one? How many times you heard this one? Uh, oh, I was just joking. You know, I, I delivered some great insult. And oh, I just joking, you know, I was just joking. Uh, uh, you know, man, I wish my wife could cook like that. Oh, I'm just joking, you know. And there are probably things that you shouldn't be joking about, uh, especially so the the verbiage, the 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 tongue that we have is a indicator of that. Now, James is going to deal more with the tongue by the time you get to chapter three, uh, and he's going to tell you you better make sure you have good reins on them. Uh, because that tongue is a hard thing to control. And so, um, you know, I was thinking about James 26. Once we get denominationalism, their verbiage gives them away. They don't talk Christianity. They don't talk Bible. They talk denominationalism. I had a lady one time, and I don't throw this back at you at this point. I had a lady one time, she asked me what I did for a living. I was at a convenience store checking out. We was just talk, chatting, and I said, oh, I'm a gospel preacher. She said, really? She said, are you a member of the Church of Christ? I said, yeah. I said, how'd you know that? She said, only members of the Church of Christ call themselves gospel preachers. Everybody else is a reverend, a pastor, minister, which is not a bad term, minister, but uh, uh, she said, only members of the church say gospel preacher. Well, there's a few things I wanted to say as you was talking. Number one, Jesus said in John chapter 13, 34, mm -hmm. he says, uh, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another by this, mm -hmm. <laughs> by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Amen. And so the coarse jesting, 
the vulgar language, the obscene jokes, those things don't demonstrate, number one, the love of God, number two, the love for my fellow man, whether it is my brother and sister in Christ or my spouse, my children. And so that love you have one for another is so important. Number two, uh, it caused me to think about when Paul was rebuking the church at Corinth because they were taking one another to court. And so when I think about true religion, true religion understands that my, uh, the way that I treat my brother, my sister, is going to be a reflection of Christianity to the world. That's right. And Paul says in verse number two, which I find it very powerful, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And so the idea there is, is that our moral lifestyle, which is demonstrating who God is, Christ living in us, the hope of glory, that's going to demonstrate to them, this is how we ought to handle the matter. That's I don't right. have to go to the world in order to, to solve this problem because God has given us what we need in the scriptures to solve the problem. Reminds mm -hmm. us of what Peter said, that he's given us everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge. But another point I wanted to make was uh, Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 5. Walk in wisdom toward those who are without. Now, this goes back to the tongue as it relates to James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Right. And so if I'm walking in wisdom, I'm going to make sure that even if my verbiage may not be vulgar, it may not be the best thing, the wisest thing to say, because it's identified with something that is vulgar. Mm. Proverbs 11 and verse number 30, the Bible says the tree of knowledge is the fruit of wisdom is the tree of, well, let me go back there. Let me go get it. Proverbs 11 and verse number 30. There the Bible says, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. And he that when it souls is wise. Mm -hmm. And so I'm walking in wisdom. I have to make sure that my verbiage, my speech is going to elevate holiness and God and Christianity. Why? Because uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 3 I want to make sure that I am walking in wisdom, but I want to make sure that I'm walking as a person in the light. Amen. Amen. I, I, and you, you brought to my attention uh, uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse 34 and, or 35 and 36, but it's out of the heart uh, uh, of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaketh. And then he talks about uh, that we will be judged by every idle word that we have spoken. That, that to me, is a dangerous. In fact, Mike, I ran across an interesting stat just uh, uh, a few days ago in regards uh, to our tongue. Evidently, uh, the, the average person speaks about 64 uh, of the equivalent of a 64 page book every day. Now, now think about that, a six, 1600, uh, 16,000 words a day is the average. Now we all, you and I both know individuals who speak twice that amount, right? But just think about this. I, 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 was, I was reading this particular illustration. It said, in one week, you speak the equivalent of a 450 page book. 450 page book. That's a pretty thick book. Uh, to, in a month, you speak 480,000 words. This is just average person. That's equivalent uh, to a book of almost 2,000 pages. In one year, you speak equivalent to four volumes of the, in, 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 in the Encyclopedia Britannica. In, in one year, you produce with your words that amount. So if you stretch that out over 70 years of a lifetime, 
then this fellow suggests that, that we, on an average person, speaks 403 million words. That's equivalent to nine times of a 44 volume Encyclopedia Britannica. You produce in just the words you speak, uh, nine uh, sets. So you can imagine if your library in the back there was just full of Encyclopedia Britannicas, every, time, every day you put a new one up there and by the end of your life, you have completed uh, uh, 44 volumes and nine sets of that. I, that blew my mind. So now if, if my words are an indicator and uh, of my conversion and they are uh, going to be uh, a part of my judgment, uh, all of the passages that you just mentioned ought to be on my mind so that I am very cautious, right? About what I say and what I speak. That's right. You think of what Jesus said in Matthew 12, verses 33 through 37. He said, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad for a tree is known by its fruit. A tree is known by its fruit. So our words actually demonstrate what's going on in our head. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak? Jesus said, speak good things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you, that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. And so you think of the stats that you just gave. And you think about how often we talk. It behooves us not to just be talking, just to be talking. Mm -hmm. It behooves us as Christians uh, to use our words now let me let me say this as I make one another point to use our words that's going to glorify God that's going to build up in the most holy faith that's going to demonstrate that we're not in other folks business mm. now now I, I'm trying to be nice right here brother Pope joy <laughs> But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 11, the Bible says that you also aspire to lead a quiet life. Why? Mm -hmm. To mind your own business mm. and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. A Christian ought to be a professional when it comes to minding his own business. Ooh. A professional at minding your own business. Woo! You, you know that ain't true. <laughs> and, and, and that's why there are some things man, I can see and I see it happening, but that ain't my business. Now, we're not talking about matters of morality. In matters of morality, we have an obligation to speak up. But there are some things a man ought to mind his own business. That's his business. And so we have to keep that in mind. Now, this is part of the apostles' doctrine. Yes. You know? And so there are some things that are not our business. Leave it alone. Amen. And keep in mind that God is still operating in the affairs of men. Hmm. We have a responsibility to protect our souls. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Here's the only point I want to make with that. When a person guards their heart with all diligence, then that's going to aid them when it comes to what springs out the issues of life. You can tell when people are not minding their own business. They're always talking about other people's business. That's not Christianity. That's, that leads to gossip, backbiting. It leads to splits in congregation. It even leads to marriages dissolving. Mind your business. 
one brother said this on one occasion. I'm gonna hush up, brother Pope Joy. He said, uh, you got men that are always looking at another man's yard. Man, mow your own grass. Amen. Need I say Amen. More? Yep. Uh, Sister Roberts uh, uh, is uh, has joined us, and she says uh, she says uh, uh, that speaking and thinking that way shows that we are no different than the world, and and that's that conversion process that is clearly seen with the tongue. You made me think of uh, uh, the the reason why Paul tells Timothy that the younger widows ought to marry. Uh, it says. Uh, uh, that uh, wherewithal they learn, if they're not, they can learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but tattlers also, busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Now, if, we now, can all if, learn that. Yeah. Now, if they would employ what Paul told the church at Corinth in his second letter, chapter 10, and verse number five, taking every thought captive. Mm. Man, when I was a kid, go. mama used to say, boy, just because you think it don't mean you got to say it. <laughs> that's <Good exactly>. right. <laughs> no, that, listen, that's exactly right. And uh, it may be one of the reasons why uh, Paul in the book of Romans reaches all the way back to the Psalms and says their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. That's right. So uh, uh, these are all things that that really demonstrate. And by the way, you you add to this. I don't I don't think we're going to have time to get to the rest of this, Mike. That at least I had in my head. Uh, in regards to this, but you know, social media, and that's what we're on right now. So we're not anti-social media, but we do need to understand, and uh, it, it's, it, it is very easy, or uh, let me say this, is it's easier on social media to be careless in your speech if you are not careful. Uh, we, we live in a day of, uh, uh, text messaging, email, cell phones, Twitter, blogs, Facebook. I don't even know what that real thing is that I heard about today. Didn't even know anything about it until today. Hopefully I'm not giving you any, uh, but Instagram, all that kind of stuff. And we just say things that immediately come to our mind. Now, without getting into the politic of the issue or the politics of the issue, is that not one of the things that plagues even the highest of offices uh, in America and around the world is we speak without thinking and it's so easy just to put something out rather than to say, wait a minute, let me think this through. I will tell you, Mike, that I've written a lot of things on uh, Facebook or something, some kind of social media that before I posted, I stopped and I erased it. And I said, no, I'm not, number one, I'm not going to go there. That's minding my own business. I'm just not going to go there. I don't have time for that. I don't want to get involved in that discussion or uh, it's going to create more havoc than uh uh, if I just leave it alone, I'm going to leave it alone. And uh, so it, it's so much easier uh, to to do that. And, and uh, I, I liken it, you know, sometimes we say, well, you know, listen, 97% of the time, I'm real good with social media. I, you know, that if the tongue is a poisonous asp, uh, that would be like me saying, you know what? 97% of the day, I'm not a murderer. Only uh, that 3% really, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm only I'm only a murderer. I only murder people with my tongue about 3% of the time. And so I, I think the conversion process that we're talking about uh, is vitally important, not just from the denominational realm, certainly there, but we have to be careful with that as well. Yeah, we have to be careful with that, uh, Brother Pope Joy. I'm going to address that last point that you just made about 97% of the time. 
Mm. In Ecclesiastes 10, verses 1 and 2, dead flies putrefy the perfumer's <laughs> ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor. Then, well, that 3% is going to be pretty foul. So does a little folly in one respected for wisdom and honor. Just a little just, folly? Just a little folly. And, and you mean about 3%, like this, 3 of folly? You know, it's, it's, it's like someone like you and I going out there doing something because we 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 have a, a little whim we want to fulfill. But well, you're done. You might as well pack it up. You know, yeah, you can repent, you can confess, but you might as well pack it up. Mm -hmm. You know, because anybody gonna listen to you. But I, I wanted to say, since this went uh in the direction of the tongue, Solomon said in Proverbs 7 and verse number 17, verse number chapter 17, verse number seven, I'm sorry. Excellent speech is not becoming of a fool. Oof. And so, and, and that, that take is, takes me to Ephesians 5 and verse number 15, walk in wisdom among those who are without. So when we think about walking in wisdom, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the times because the days are evil, we want to always be walking in wisdom. And it goes back to the old adage that you want to measure twice, cut once. Mm. And exactly. so... Our speech must be that, what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.12, plainness of speech. It needs to be a speech that 2 Corinthians 7, verse number 4, four is boldness of speech. If we're going to use our speech, it ought to be plain speech, bold speech. It ought to be speech that is uh, fitly, words fitly spoken, or like apples mm -hmm. of, of uh, gold and of gold. Of silver, Proverbs yep. 25 and verse number 11. And so uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but the tongue, God wants our tongues to be proper. And that's something that we all need to be working on every single time. And people ought to be able to say, just like what was said to Peter, he said, uh, that little damsel said, yeah, he's been, he's one of Jesus' disciples. His speech bereaved him. Yep. Why? Because uh, they've been with the Lord. And so that's we right. ought to know that we have been with God because of our speech. Right. That's exactly right. That is an indicator. And uh, it is one of the great indicators. Uh, the Bible speaks, as we have just seen, uh, 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 much on this particular topic. Uh, but by the way, listen, you take as much time as uh, you need on this because I think this is one of the uh, uh, lessons that is certainly a hot topic by an indicator of how people's uh, words are uh, uh, in, in the world. You hear things and you're like, certainly I didn't just hear that Christian say that. And uh, uh, so there are a lot of things that I think are vitally important to that. Uh, Brother, yes, sir. Some, some, some Christians talk more like politicians than they do Jesus. And um, it's, it's, it's very unfortunate. I, I'll just call it what it is. You know, we got three minutes. I'm trying to be nice about this. But when my speech sounds more like a politician or some type of party, doesn't matter what party you cling to, your speech should be like your master. Now, Jesus said, you are of your father. Mm. You know, so we got to pick one. Our speech must be like our master. And so in Psalm 52 and verse number two, he says, your tongue divides destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. We don't want Jesus. The Bible says that there was, uh, there was no deceit, no guile found in his mouth. That's first Peter chapter two. And so we know that we ought to be speaking truth with our neighbor, Ephesians four. And so we ought to just keep these things in mind. I'm done. I'm done talking, Brother Pope. Oh, no, you, you reminded me of uh, a friend of ours, uh, Brother Omari French out there in uh, San Francisco, who uh, uh, concerning his words will say uh, things like, I will slit your throat with the gospel. <laughs> yeah, he gets after it. <laughs> But it is like a razor. Our words are like a razor. Uh, and they, they cut. Now, listen, they can cut the heart. That's generally where, rather than the throat, 
We want the heart to be cut. Uh, the words of Peter, uh, cut the heart. Uh, the words of Stephen, uh, cut the heart. Uh, the words of Jesus burned in uh, the hearts of men. And so that's what we want in regards to that, that our words ought to be uh, pointed and true. They ought to be precise and clear so that people understand not only where we stand, but also where they should stand. That's right. We want to make sure that our tongues speak righteousness. Then Psalm 35, 28. And so when we keep our tongues where they need to be, then uh, people are going to, um, they're going to at least hear the gospel. Yeah. And so this is why we go into all the world and we preach and we teach and we give people hope, you know, uh, really the Lord's church should be growing by leaps and bounds right now. And the reason why is because there are so many people that are hopeless that even the world understands that if, if you have problems, call this hotline. They know people have problems. They're locked up in their house. And even though they might be receiving a paycheck, they're locked up in their house when God made us relational creatures. Right. And so here we come with the gospel, but not just with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but Paul said, even our own lives to the church of Thessalonica. Right. And so we're demonstrating to them that God is working with us. And so we want him to work with you. He wants you to be saved. And that's what we want too. Amen. Amen. Brother Mike, it's always such a pleasure. I hope that you get to join us next week because I want to I want to follow up on this with uh, uh, what he says in verse number, James says in verse number 27, and uh, the ideal of compassion being a part of, of that. You know, uh, that's, uh, that's something that we've got to consider uh, in regards to our Christian life as an indicator. Whether or not we are compassionate to people, indicates to people whether or not we care. And some people, I, I realize it's not a, 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 a fully true statement, but some people will say, and I think there's some truth to this, they will say people don't want to know how much you, they don't want to know, they don't want to hear how much you know until they know how much you care. There, there's a great truth to that. Jesus demonstrated a great deal of care for people. And it opened up the doors of their heart to be able to listen. And so uh, our tongues are one thing, uh, our, our communication, but our compassion is another. And so I hope you get to join us next week for that. Thank you so much for being uh, with, with us today. Thank you, brother. All right. God bless, and everyone have a wonderful day. Amen.